Welcome back, my friends, to the show that never ends. Hemp Present on Cannabis Radio. I am Vivian McPeak, your host. If you have feedback or would like to suggest a guest or topic for Hemp Present, email me at hempresent at gmail.com. Stitch Miller is a Seattle-based medical marijuana activist. Stitch and his partner, Joanna McKee, founded Seattle's first cannabis cooperative, Green Cross Patient Co-op, in 1993, five years before Washington State approved medical marijuana. I'm honored to have Stitch in the Digital Hemp Present studio with me today to tell us all about his role in that historic group. Welcome, Stitch, to Cannabis Radio. Howdy. Howdy, my brother. Yeah. So, Stitch, you founded Green Cross with your partner and my friend, Joanna McKee, who sadly passed away in 2017. I want to dive into Green Cross and the work that you did. But first, how did you meet Joanna and what was that experience like? When I went up to Alaska to help them fight a law they thought they could change their constitution with, they banned the use of uh, cannabis. And it was a free for all. And they they passed the law, but it, they never could use it because it's against the Constitution. You have a right to have it in your own home, grow in your own home, and consume it in your own home under the right to privacy in Alaska. I was up there for that, and I was talking to Jack Hara, and I saw this lady coming across the parking lot, walking like she had an axe in her hand, a double head, <laughs> holding it out, but there was no axe there. But her hand was in position. And she was strutting toward Jack. And I thought to myself, oh, I'll get to meet her. And one thing led to another. And we had 27 years of absolute joy. Of course, we fought. We fought each other at times. And we fought a lot of those people together. Uh, he introduced, right. Jack introduced us and we were off. Oh, so you're introduced by Jack Hare himself. Yes. Yes. Oh, I think wow. kind, that's kind of, of different. That was kind of an omen. Mm-hmm. Fascinating. What led to the creation of Green Cross and how much of a factor was the AIDS epidemic in Joanna's and your desire to get medical marijuana to suffering patients? Um, the University of Washington put her in a wheelchair. We were headed to Europe. Had a job waiting for me, uh, I think, waiting for me at the uh, Hemp Museum. I didn't know about it until a couple of years later. But we decided not to go to Europe after she became handicapped because of what they might be able to do for her if we stuck there. They didn't do much at all for her, to be truthful, other than give her pain medication. Uh, we started growing for ourselves, so we had it for our own use. And we had way more in this little four-foot square than we could consume. So we had this idea, we'll give it to AIDS patients. Joanne lobbied the uh, member of the Kitsap uh, community that was in charge of the AIDS coordinator. And finally, after several times of approaching her, she talked to some of the patients, found out they wanted the cannabis we had. So she brought us three names with phone numbers and a fourth one I delivered to her each month for a fourth person that turned out worked at the same nursing service I did. And uh, about six months after her uh being put in a wheelchair, we moved to shore, and her case manager gave me the job of being her nurse. So I took care of her for the next 25 years. Uh, the four people, we got a little coverage in what we were doing, and we started getting contacts from other people, and we came up with the name Green Cross Patient Co-op, Green Cross for Safety Patient Co-op, because it's the most socialist thing you can find in the Midwest, is a co-op. <laughs> Nice. So I thought I could draw people in with the names. Uh, everybody thought the green cross was a representative of the plant being green. Okay. And we kind of had a, a very interesting first few years. Shortly after we moved into this house in 96, we were notified by the National Safety Council we couldn't use that name. So we called them up and talked to them a while because we knew they would gave grants for other businesses to use the name green cross because we found it in the, on the web. They agreed, as long as we use Green Cross Patient Co-op, the full name, that it'd be legit. And a lot of people copied the Green Cross part, had no idea who it belonged to, and I'm quite sure the Safety Council didn't even want to mess with it anymore. It was so far out of hand. Uh, I moved here because I, I could, uh, well, district attorney gave us his assistant as our court representative 
and guide for legal purposes. Uh, Satterberg, Dan Satterberg, who later became the district attorney, and he still stayed in touch with us until he left the office. Uh, he said, I do anything Norm asked me to do, but I don't know anything about medical marijuana. I don't know anything really about marijuana. And so Joanne picked out about an inch thick uh, copies of double-sided, double-column pages that were taken out of books. And I made up a book of those that one inch of pages. And Dan Sederberg studied that for the next week after he delivered it on Friday. The following Friday, he called us up and says, I'm ready to go to the Supreme Court. So, and he did not want any more information. He said he had more than most anybody would ever have. And he probably was right. Wow. So, um, Stitch, how did Green Cross work? What was the process that resulted in patients getting access to medical grade marijuana? I mean, how did how did all that work? Who who got okay? Uh, each patient had to bring a letter from his doctor. That was long before the days of the doctors in a box we had here for a few years. And it was amazing. And at the time we were busted by the DEA in 95, we had 40 or 42 patients. I'm not sure anymore. And uh, the, the narcs that had busted us did us all while I was, while we were delivering medicine to other people. And they, uh, told us when we got there, she, we're really sorry we did this, but we can't undo it. We had orders to do it, but we want to testify on your behalf in court. And they wow. were serious. So how did, how did patients, uh, you, you would, would you just, was there an, a, a, a general amount that you'd get everybody or would you kind of make an assessment based upon their needs or how did all that work out? If they were financially really in a bad place, we usually did it as a donation, a quarter ounce a week. Uh, most people paid for their quarter ounce. Mm -hmm. And uh, the chief of police, well, yeah, the chief of police on Bainbridge Island said, I'd like to be able to return it if I happen to pull over any of your people or my, one of our officers does. Uh, but you've got to make it so they can't sell it on the street. So I compacted it into a little half-inch rock with a, a bolt head, uh, a small sledgehammer, and a piece of garden hose stuck in a piece of wood that was drilled out with a bottom in it. So I'd make up these eighth of an ounce rocks, put two of them in a bag, that was a quarter ounce. And we told the patients just slice it off as they need it. And huh. they seemed to think that worked pretty good. Wow. After we got over here, we had uh, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday each week from one till five or six, something like that, where people come over and pick up their medicine. If somebody was gonna pick it up for another patient, they had to bring a note from the patient and the patient had to call us that morning so that we knew this person was coming. Otherwise, if you didn't get, if we didn't get the phone call, they didn't get the medicine unless we really knew who they were. Uh, we operated like that until about 2000, uh, 2000 June, we had about four days left to making it five years out our back door. And the only time the cops came by here was when our housekeeper uh, didn't have her letter with her when the cops stopped her at the mouth of the alley. They were sort of laying there to see what was going on. They came back, and being nice to the cops does wonders. <laughs> the cop wanted to know that uh, she was a patient. She had a doctor's letter. So I went in and made a copy of the one in, on file. You never take a file copy out of the okay. office. And I handed it to him. He started copying. I said, you don't need to copy it. I made that copy for you. And then we went through a uh, rotation of one cop was looking in the little trailer that somebody was remodeling in our backyard, Damaris. And because she put secret garden on the, on the flat just for the fun of it. And they'd be looking in there trying to figure out where the garden was. Huh. One would be talking to me, and one was talking to Joanne, and then they rotate. Okay. 
And after about 40 minutes, we went back to business. They left and things uh, returned to what it was. Uh, that, that's, that's quite the story, Stitch. we got to go to a quick break. Uh, so we're going to take a, a very short break, and then we're going to come right back with our second uh, installment here. We'll be right back. Time to roll out for the people that let us hemp present. Hang loose. We're coming right back. All right, we're back with Stitch Miller. Um, Stitch, did you want to continue any of that? Sure. Uh, when we were busted in 95 on May 3rd, the DEA had ordered us busted because they didn't like an editorial. It was on the back page of the Sunday, first section Sunday, uh, press, yes, see, well, anyway, Tacoma newspaper. And uh, they just lost it because the guy told the truth. He talked about how they avoided going after meth labs, found articles on the web about it. And the, the chance, the risk Joanna I was taking, it took me three years to convince the reporter that he, we appreciated getting busted because of his article, because it gave us a great deal of power. You can't change the law without attacking the law from the court side. It was our belief. We didn't tell him that at the time, or he probably wouldn't have touched it. But the DEA never came to, never uh, brought us to court. It was, uh, we got six months on the warrant. The judge that had the warrant case kept extending it because he wasn't satisfied with the uh, the brief of the week on why why we should throw it out. And finally, we came, we were told by the district attorney's office in Kitsap County that uh, uh, the judge we were with had a personal thing about he wanted a, a warrant for cannabis to say it on there, not just use a general, well, he was breaking the law. And we ended up walking away from it after it goes to the appeals court and the appeals court said we won and they sealed the decision so the uh, judge did not get a chance to get his uh, decision brought into law. Stitch, and I, had, he, I had heard that in the 95 bust, you and Joanna's gathering of signatures for a citizen, a citizen's initiative uh, was kind of a red flag for federal agents and they persuaded the local authorities in Kitsap County to shut down your grow op and that the sheriff's officials uh, reportedly seized 120 plants, but that they did you a favor by hiding rather than seizing med- medicine bottles full of weed around your house so you'd still be able to take care of your patients, even hiding canisters of herb under couch cushions. Is that true? True. Uh, uh, and tops of curtains, they had it hid places better than you would think about hiding Easter eggs. <laughs> they did only the quarter ounce. They left the half ounce and full ounces in the paper bag in the freezer where it was, as if it was moved. I noticed it had been moved. And we found the last quarter ounce as we were moving out of there uh, six or eight weeks later. And they did not have a red flag. The red flag they had was the editorial I was telling you about. And at the time we were busted, it said bust them and prove they aren't who they say they are. And we were exactly who we said we were. So they had a real mess on their hands. And they just, I think it was a really hard blow to the war on drugs because the cannabis and the feds seemed like it backed off, but they tried to keep the news from going all over the United States, I've noticed. So we don't know what's happening in the South and so on like that on, on the level we were. Right. Stitch, Joanna was very high profile, uh, giving media interviews and showing up in person at the city attorneys and county prosecutors offices and and doing things like aggressively influencing state legislation and citizens initiatives. Uh, For example, demanding that no limit be placed on the number of plants a patient could possess before she would throw her support behind an initiative. She often appeared in her wheelchair, sporting her signature eye patch to testify at the state legislature. Joanna appeared to almost everyone to be fearless in the face of great risk in her advocacy. So, so was that wasn't an act. She was, she was fearless. She was fearless. Um, she was only worried after the bus. She was only worried that I wasn't, uh, happy about what happened. And I said, no, no, we can, get, we can get this in front of the people now. Uh, hmm. that was her only real concern. It was how I was going to react to the fact we were busted. Right. Uh, everybody was really wonderful to us. The cops that were taking us to court, uh, taking us to jail that day, 
when they notice we they they let us give our papers and whatever to this lady that was one of the members to take our dog home so they our dog wouldn't be there by herself and one of the cops noticed we were uh shoving money through the windows edge because i didn't want to go to jail with a couple of grand in my pocket so i was we were passing the money to her. The other cop said to her, the first cop, what are they doing over there? And he says, turn around and look at the wall. Because they didn't want to see any, anything happen that they'd have to report on. Right. Yeah, it was, uh, it's been magical ever since we started this. I wouldn't say it was easy. But because of her fearlessness, uh, people uh, really had a lot of respect for us. Uh, the dog on the front of the wheelchair that pulled it a uh, sled style was my Akita wolf that she had given me as a puppy. Mm-hmm. And that was a big uh, thing for the TV crews and so on. Seeing a dog pulling in a wheelchair, they thought that was quite novel. <laughs> so it was the first thing she thought of when she was stuck in a wheelchair. She ordered shortly after we got home from the hospital, she ordered the pulling harness that Lummy wore. She was very mediagenic. Um, and, 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 you know, Stitch, Joanna was really high profile and you were a little bit more in the background, kind of acting as her handler or her strategist. Can you talk about that for a bit? OK, yeah. Uh, Joanne would go over what she was going to do that day. And she had been uh, she had the opinion that if she showed the, uh, the mayor was coming to our, our apartment and she had the uh, belief that. If she showed the mirror our gross, she'd know we were serious. And I, this is the thing, probably the, the biggest thing I did for her was, I said, no, that's not fair to the, to the uh, mayor of the island. And she says, what do you mean? She's a, she's a state, she's an officer of the government. By law, she'd have to turn in if she saw a grow. She might not do it, but why bet on that? She does, you don't need to put her in that position. You tell her what we're doing. You explain to her, show her the forms and all that. And the fact that we already had the chief of police on the island on our side uh, meant it was more or less a routine thing. That's the way Joanne was looking at it. But she wanted to show that girl. She wanted to show her girl all the time. And that's, that got her busted up in Alaska when she was. they were trying to get her involved in a murder case. And she told her she wasn't part of that murder case. So he showed the cops her growth proved she was being honest. And they ended up giving her uh, three years probation for having to grow in her bedroom. So I thought that would be enough for her to learn, but it wasn't. She had, she wanted to do it again. She was a bit on the wild side too. <laughs> That's an understatement. Yeah. Um, the, the legalization law I-502 that was passed in Washington in 2012, pretty much threw patients under the cannabis in exchange for what many in the reform community view as commoditization rather than actual legalization. Uh, We only have a couple minutes before the next break, but, but that resulted in lower patient plant and possession counts than patients had before the quasi legalization. What did Joanna think about I-502 and how do you see the current state of medical marijuana in Uh, in Washington? Medical marijuana has got hopes. There is a hearing on the 29th of this month down in Olympia they're going to start up and make a law for patients and probably get the the right numbers. The health department is is actually the one who is going to be involved. We we did this same thing back uh, about the time uh, of 502, a little before that. No, it was after that. We got it through. We had it all set up. And Joanne and I and several other actives even posed for pictures when she signed it. She didn't tell us, and we didn't find out until a couple of weeks later. She had canceled the uh, definitions of all the important words that had to be defined in the law to be legal. So consequently, uh, uh, we had no uh, no medical law. And it is true that we felt like we were thrown under the bus. We were allowed to gross uh, a a quantity of plants, uh, six or 15, if your doctor thought it was necessary. But that was the limit. And nowadays, it's almost impossible for a person who like goes to the VA to get a letter uh, because, of course, they won't do it. It's a different environment. It's a lot harder on patients. I don't know. They'd like to see patients spending all their money at the uh, stores with the tax. 
but uh, <clears throat> there is patients are still helping patients. Right. And it looks like we may get a lot of where we can have our, I'm hoping to have our own dispensaries where we'll have stuff grown by patients for the patients to pick from. Okay. Um, we got to go to another break. Okay. We're talking with Stitch Miller from Green Cross. Don't go anywhere. We're going to come back with our final segment. Time to roll out for the people that let us have present. Hang loose. We're coming right back. We're back with our final segment with Stitch Miller. Um, hey, Stitch, you, you, after Joanna passed away in November of 2017, among the speakers at her memorial service uh, were King County Prosecutor Dan Satterberg and former State Senator Jeannie Cowells. Of course, Senator Cowells was a longtime alley of the medical cannabis community. Um, but what was it like for you seeing the King County prosecutor, not only at her service, but speaking out and championing her fearless political activism? I mean, where else would the prosecutor uh, be doing something like that? What was that like for you? Seattle is definitely the uh, promised land as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Dan did such a great job covering Joanne's record he didn't leave much for me to say. And that was all right with me because him saying, I wish I had a copy of what he said that day because it was fantastic. It was just powerful. I mean, yes. he told the story that he didn't know what was going on. And then she came along and she was just like not taking no, you know, and not only did she educate him, but she pushed so hard in the media and other ways that, that she didn't give him an alternative, you know? Well, um, Go ahead. Norm, uh, Norm knew that we needed a medical marijuana system here in the state. And when we called him to tell him we were buying a home here, we were moving into a home we bought, the chief of police uh, covered us here in, in Seattle. The sheriff, on the other hand, said, I don't care whether we can get a prosecution or not. We'll bust you every time you turn around if you try to operate from unincorporated King County. So we bought a house in the city of Seattle. We called up Norm after we bought the house and was moving in. And he says, I've been hoping you guys would call and, and come over here and, and set up and, and call me. And that's how we ended up with Dan Satterberg. And uh, we had we were treated so nicely when we moved out of our house because of the complaints of a couple of neighbors who thought they'd become big shots. And they got disowned by the neighborhood. Uh, turned us in and complained about it. So the cops told us we had to close. Six weeks later, we reopened over on uh, at the the brick showrooms in uh, off of Fourth Avenue in uh, Georgetown. And every night when we we had the cops on our side to the point every night when we went to close down and go home. They were cruising around our block until we were in our cars and on the road. They didn't want anybody trying to t hold us up as we were moving from the office to the uh, to our cars because they knew we were taking our medicine home with us. We didn't leave it there for somebody to break in and probably take care of the safe with a sledgehammer. So, hey, Stitch, real quick, how were you inter initially introduced to cannabis yourself? How did you how did you first? Oh, it was on Easter Sunday, 1968. I was at a friend's house. Saturday night, we had a party, and I was leaving about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, and somebody, the third person in the house came home, ripped out of his gourd. I, I knew he wasn't drinking by his behavior, but I couldn't figure out what was going on. <laughs> and the girl who had been the girl across the street as a kid who I was visiting says, you want to try some? I says, yes. Yeah. And I walked out of there that day, first time I smoked it, it felt like my legs were long enough that I was, I could see how they got the concept of trucking, <laughs> because that's the way it felt like. Right. And I've been a, a, a user ever since. Joanne spent probably six months convincing me I was a patient, not just a user. And I do believe at this time, anybody that smokes regularly, especially if they even smoke by themselves, they're not, uh, it's not a, for fun. It's, it's because it makes them feel better. It relieves a lot of their pains in their life and it gives them a, a different advantage to look at things. They're self-medicating. 
Yep. You know, Stitch, I, I, I want to, as you know, I was the director of Seattle Hemp Fest for uh, almost all of the 28 years of the event. And uh, it was a very gigantic, expensive event that was free to attend. And uh, every year, Joanna would approach me back in back of the main stage, backstage, and quietly pass me an envelope uh, with hundreds, hundreds of dollars, sometimes, sometimes more than hundreds. Um, and, uh, and never, never, never made a big deal out of it, you know, never took any credit for it. Um, and, and that's the kind of person that Joanna was, and that's the kind of operation that you guys were. And I'm just so thankful to have you on the show and to, to speak all this, uh, this history, man, this amazing hempstery. Um, unfortunately we run out of time, but, uh, I have so much respect for you and, 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 and I, you know, love Joanna dearly. Um, and, uh, and thank you so much, man. Yes. She, she's what made the movement, but she had to get around. She had to have, uh, there's no doubt about it. People to help her out. And no doubt about it. it was my job. I was her nurse. I got to go. I got to go stitch. Okay. Bye-bye. But, but I appreciate you, man. And that includes this installment of Hemperson on Cannabis Radio. When it comes to prohibition, you got the right not to remain silent. Activism requires a voice to so find your voice. Speak up for justice because resistance is fertile. The Hemperson intro music is Seven Mile Beach by Joanne Rand. The outro music is Take Back the Plant by Stickerbush. See you next time. Stay strong.